Angus Gill is a Golden Guitar winning singer, songwriter, musician and producer who always has one interesting project or another on the go. His latest project is the album Departure and Arrival, recorded with Seasons of Change, who also appeared on his album Three Minute Movies. And I'm really looking forward to asking Angus all about it. Hello, Angus. Hello, Sophie. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Been really enjoying the album and yeah it's it's a it's a different proposition to your previous work but then again you don't really ever stay still or do the same thing over and over again so I shouldn't be surprised I'm not surprised it's just really interesting which is why I want to ask you about it so when did you start working on the album well it was my publisher Philip Mortlock who said to me kind of during COVID he said you need to do an album of just Angus songs you Mm -hmm. know because I had T. C. Cassidy cut a few songs that I wrote on my own and they were received with radio and I've had a few other artists cut songs that I've just written on my own. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet I tend to co-write a lot just because I write songs for all different kinds of people and um, and it's a, it's a job for me. So I, I have different writing appointments week in, week out and I don't know whether it's a song for me or a song for another artist, um, you know, particularly when I'm, when I'm writing with other songwriter friends. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, we kind of don't know until we're halfway through whether it's going to be something for me or something that I, I pitch to another artist, uh, unless, of course, I'm working with an artist writing specifically for them. So um, when you write on your own, you've got to allow that time to have a date with yourself, you know. <laughs> right. so, um, you know, there was plenty of time to do that um, during lockdown. So I started on this collection of songs in, in 2020 and um, and some of them took a couple of years to be to be finished you know for me kind of chipping away at them and then putting them aside and getting sidetracked by some other thing and then coming back and going I really like that idea it's worth chipping away at it and and you know getting it to evolve mm-hmm. um, so uh, come out of its you know come out of its cocoon yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> given that you do write with other people a lot um is it harder to motivate yourself to write just for you because there's not that sense of oh this is this is destined for someone else's album so so I'm gonna have to do it now does it feel almost like you don't give yourself permission to write just for yourself no I, I really don't find it any different it's just that I'm carving out time where I'm just sitting on the lonesome so right. you. <laughs> And you prefer being sociable. You'd rather have other people to write with. Well, uh, it, it says something about my rubbish social life, doesn't it? You know, <laughs> I only you can say that, Angus. <laughs> but I will say, since we're talking about working with others, this is not not just just an Angus Gill on your own album because you brought in Seasons of Change, who you had worked with before. So what made it an album that was right for them as opposed to you bringing in some other musicians? Well, I was going to get um, the drummer Pete Luscombe and bass player Bill McDonald um, into a studio and just track kind of bed tracks with them. And then I thought, hang on a minute, why don't I just get the whole band back together? <laughs> and it, it was it was a really good decision because when, I, when I'd kind of had all the songs finished, I, I booked the players and I still was a bit unsure uh, what songs I was going to choose for the album. So I, I booked them a couple of months ahead because I needed to to be able to get them all in the same the same place at the same time. But I I had, you know, I was still yet to decide on the final track listing. I had so much things to choose from. Uh, and eventually it all fell into place closer to the date. But mm. in hindsight, I'm so glad I... I you know book that group of players because uh they were perfect for the songs and and brought you know such a unique flavor uh to the songs as well so mm-hmm. yeah that that's how i um i got them involved on another project and i had so much of a blast making three minute movies with them so uh t- to be back together and also i i'd worked with them before so i uh, i knew how how everyone works and how we work as a collective 
So um, it, it made it easier going in the second time around and everything was cut live. Uh, um, a, a lot of the vocals that you hear were, were even cut live and, and that's not normally usually go in and overdub them afterwards. But, um, you know, most of the things were cut live. Um, we did have some extra um, musicians. We had a great percussionist, Daniel Sedanik, who's played in Steely Dan and, and, and many of other groups. Um, he overdubbed some percussion. Uh, we had a musical saw player on there uh, from Greece. Uh, we had my good friend Jeff Taylor from the Time Jumpers play accordion on a track. And we had the great Lucky Oceans play pedal oh. steel on a song called Start Up the Old Dance again. So there were a few overdubs, but, but most of it was done in the same room at the same time. We tracked without a click track. So it felt like we were making music. We were just playing off each other. You know, if someone sped up slightly, you know, you'd go with that. Uh, right. If someone slowed down slightly, you'd, you'd lean into that as well. And, uh, and therefore it's got a, a real rock and kind of band vibe. Mm -hmm. um, but, but that band, you know, they're, I call them seasons of change, but, but they're, they're the guys that play in Paul Kelly's band. Mm -hmm. Pete Luscombe on drums, Bill McDonald on bass, Cameron Bruce on keyboards and Dan Kelly on guitars. We also had my good mate Billy Miller from the Ferrets come in and play guitar and sing some great harmonies on the songs as well uh, because he wrote uh, three or four of the songs with me where yeah. I wrote the lyrics and he wrote the music. So that was an interesting collaboration. Um, and uh, and it's, it's still, I, I made an exception for those ones because, you know, all of the songs on this album are still my lyrics. So even though Billy come in and, and contributed musically on on those couple of songs that we did together. I, I still thought, well, you know, I'm not breaking the rules. I make the rules, so you know. <laughs> to say it's your album, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, but no, it, it was really special working that way, um, and, and it was kind of a different. Billy brought a, a different flavour to the project as well, because normally when I track a, a quote unquote country project or a bluegrass project a lot of the musicians are kind of playing in right from the top and then they have their moments to shine throughout the song. Whereas in this case, a lot of the songs kind of started out a little sparsely and then all of these flavors would be introduced bit by bit throughout the song. So it was mm -hmm. a different way of working and a, I think a bit more of a, a pop based um, way of production. And Billy Miller brought that in because um, the first Ferrets album that he did, which Don't Fall In Love and Janie May were on, um, Molly Meldrum produced that. And he had this thing that, that every section, there needed to be a different instrument introduced into the mix. So um, yeah, he, he kind of brought that, that philosophy to our project, which was a lot of fun. Yeah, and there are, yeah, musically this is, as I said, different to your other projects, not that you have one consistent style, but it was also that there were some sounds on it I hadn't heard on any of your previous work, um, just some right. different musical flavours, which was really interesting. So I'm wondering now, given what you said about how you recorded it, whether those flavours were there when you wrote them or whether these are things that just emerged during the recording, You thought, as you said, going with certain things that, that turned up. I think it's a bit of both. Um, you know, some of them were definitely present when we, uh, when I wrote the songs, and I could I could hear certain instrumentation. But when you get in a room with a band like that, you've got to be open to. As a producer, you've always got to have a vision for for where you want the sound to go. But you've also got to be open to um, ideas presenting themselves within a room, same as in a songwriting, um, collaboration, because mm -hmm. if you kind of shut out those ideas or ignore those ideas, you're stupid. <laughs> so, because it might be something really good there. So you have to be open to that, um, you know, presenting itself and, um, and, you know, ideas definitely presented themselves. And I, the other thing is uh, from a, a production point of view, you've got to allow, you've got to give the musicians a clear cut direction, but allow them a, enough responsibility within their own part to, to, to come up with ideas because um, you don't want to shut yourself off to those things presenting themselves a bit of gold coming out there in the bass part or, or, or the drummer doing something slightly differently and you go, Oh, what did you do there? I really like that, you know? So there's that within the first, we usually ran the songs for about 
three or four takes. And in the first two takes, you can see, you know, the discovery of the song coming through. And then mm. by about, you know, second or third take, usually that, that kind of became the take that you'd hear. Sometimes we got it first take. Um, and, uh, you know that that was the beauty of, of working that way and it was good also to come kind of out of the other side of COVID and and go back into a studio and and, and operate like that so mm -hmm. um, yeah it, it was a really and and what you see is what you get on this record too because there's no trickery involved it's it's very much raw and real um and and that's another cool thing about working working that way you've kind of got nowhere to hide you've just got to go in and 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 kind of be in sync with each other yeah um i'm also thinking as you're talking about how the tracks came together um, and things that evolved once you were in the studio and, and uh, I, you know obviously the players knew the songs i had to play but but were you tempted to actually start changing the songs that were going to be on the album because you were thinking all right no no okay <laughs> No, no, no. I, I had a clear, after I'd kind of got to a certain point, probably a month out from recording, I, I knew what, what was going to go on the album and, and I had a kind of clear cut direction with how, how I wanted things to play out. And this record, I've been, I've been a bit of a, a record hoarder over the last couple of years. I've really, I, I grew my collection from about maybe 50 albums to now I've got something like 650. Um, and so I've listened to a lot of vinyl um, during, during lockdown and um, over the last three or four years. And I've read more than I've ever read before as well. I think this year I'm on uh, my highest reading streak that I've had before. So I've been um, a lot of the songs uh, have been influenced or I've got ideas out of reading Bukowski or Cormac McCarthy or Steinbeck or um, Larry McMurtry, um, guys like that. I, I've really kind of found my, found my favorites and then just worked my way from, from book to book, you know, within yeah. their, uh, catalog. So, right. um, it's yeah. So there, there's there's definitely been ideas. Um, Bukowski inspired the song "Start Up the Old Dance Again." I I saw right. kind of um, that title just just in a book of his I was reading called "On Writing," which is the same title as that great Stephen King book that I've read a few mm. times as well. Huh. Um, and uh, and I think the context was he said, and then I start up the old dance, and I kind of. I thought, oh, start up the old dance, start up the old dance again. That'd be a cool title for a song. And so <laughs> I wrote that down. And after a period of, of working pretty intently on on a whole heap of songs, one day I woke up and that song kind of popped out, mostly fully formed. Right. Um, it could have been a baby. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> what an image, Angus. <laughs> <laughs> I gave birth to a song. <laughs> and, 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 you know, sometimes you, you get a gift like that um, mm -hmm. come along once in a while um, if you've been working really hard on something and you've, and you've been going through a bit of a slog. Every now and then you'll get a little, you know, reward like that from the universe. <laughs> You're right. Uh, I'm also, because you have some spoken word tracks on this album and I have seen you do some of this live, but um, I'm wondering whether Bukowski was also an influence on that because the stories that you're telling in those tracks, um, I was listening to, I was thinking, well, yeah, there's, some, there's, there's this wild tale on one of them in particular, but now that you're talking about the reading you've been done, I'm like, okay, some of this is starting to make sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that kind of, that song, Something Fishy, which is a spoken word piece, I've always wanted to write a spoken word piece. And that particular story is kind of based on, on real life. My grandpa was very briefly featured in a series of underbelly, you know, as this old fisherman that found, you know, the, the remains of, um, of, a, of a drug lord in, in, you know, while he was out fishing with his mate, you know, and it was, and it was kind of, um, made into a series and and of course I I took that little seed of truth and and turned it into a, a piece of fiction really um oh, right. but and the song kind of acts as a you think it's going to be a bit of a shaggy dog story but there's an implied ending at, mm. at the end of it. um so um 
uh, yeah, I, I've wanted to kind of write a murder ballad type song, but oftentimes in, in, in murder ballads that I've heard, they kind of, you know, pardon the expression, but, but they drop their pants in the first verse and, and then there's nothing left to the imagination. There's no mystery anymore. Right. Um, and so I, I, I wanted to kind of, you know, uh, have an implied ending, but, but leave a certain amount up to the listener to what, to what it means to them, you know, mm -hmm. because there's, there's several possible uh, interpretations of, of that ending. So that's what I kind of wanted to achieve with that song. And it's so different because you, you, you don't often hear spoken word pieces. And I was really, uh, I was really keen to do something to a blues groove because I wrote that in iambic pentameter mm -hmm. to a similar structure to uh, a, 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 a soliloquy called uh, Oh for the Muse of Fire. Mm -hmm. um, it's a Shakespeare, I think it was in um, Henry V. Um, so, yeah, it was a similar kind of structure to that and then I put it to a, a blues groove. Yeah, right. And I did say um, spoken word tracks, but that's because my question says, which I didn't read correctly, there is some spoken word on this too. I just, my brain went to spoken word tracks. There is one spoken word there track. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, the tone of the album otherwise, um, apart from the, um, you know, the the murder ballad uh, slash shaggy dog story, is actually I found it quite bittersweet lyrically. There's, there's you know, it's a certain amount of yearning on there. Uh, there is some unsentimental yet very heartfelt takes on life in general. So I wonder if that is a that's a tone to the to the songs that you you set on purpose once you decided which songs you were going to put on there. Yeah, yeah, I think so. It's it's um you know in 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 life life is bittersweet. I think I think a lot of the songs kind of uh you know reflect obviously there's elements of me in there, but I I wanted to write a bunch of character based songs because a lot of my past material has been very personal and there's only so long that you can keep mining that before it becomes quite stale. So uh, I wanted to kind of look outward and stick my nose into, into other people's business, whether they were real people or, or based on real people or, or fictitious. Um, so, but I, you know, I, I think it just, that that's an interesting common thread between the songs. It, it it wasn't particularly one that I that I thought about before we went into the studio, mm -hmm. but um, but it's kind of a, a link that I've I've made, I suppose, more recently or after the after the project was was done. But um, you know, going back to the kind of musical influences on here, there's there's several. Um, you, you know, ranging from Elvis Costello to to Joni Mitchell to um, uh, Paul Simon to Leonard Cohen to you know, there's there's quite a quite a mix of Randy Newman even. Um, but I wanted to kind of make an album with contrasting tracks, like um, you know, some classic records like City to City by Jerry Rafferty or um, Nilsson Schmilson by um, Harry Nilsson, or even Sergeant Peppers has got a lot of uh, contrasting tracks. And you don't hear a lot of albums like that coming out now. So, in a way, um, you know, it kind of feels like something that that should have come out in the seventies. You know. <laughs> um, well, not that I yeah sorry go on you were saying yeah with 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 some of the the different influences and i think the, the overall sound of that album it, it it feels like it's kind of from a different era in a way yeah but there's it, it also gives quite a you know a rich variety of human experience because as you said you know life is bittersweet and i think that's that's there lyrically it's also there musically which is not to suggest that it's a platter of something for everyone because it's not that um all mm. the songs do belong together even though there are there there is quite a range of sounds on there and it's still all you that's the other thing yeah and i was just reading a book by lucinda williams and she was kind of talking about the fact um that she wanted to make records that were different, you know, like some of her heroes, like Bob Dylan and Neil Young. And um, and she said, a, a critic said about her work that, you know, Lucinda makes different albums, but when you kind of take away those, those different brush strokes, at the centre of it is still Lucinda. And mm -hmm. I, I feel as, as though that's what I try and aim to do. And I, I feel as though that's that's what I I have 
you know been working towards with with these different kind of projects that I have you strip away the 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 different uh, palette of sounds and and you still have my my own stamp on on things so um, yeah. yeah it's it's fun for me to to be doing different kind of projects and exploring different sounds but but there's a reason why I do it a because I'm a very curious person and B because I, I need to do that to kind of keep what I do fresh. Yeah. Uh, if I did the same thing over and over again, I, I would struggle to keep it fresh. Um, Angus, you keep answering my questions for me before I've even asked them. <laughs> I had a question here saying, given that you're so productive, what motivates you as most as an artist? Well, you've just told me. I didn't even have to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> there were some other ones as well. I was like, oh, don't need to ask that. He's already answered that. Um, so, so I'm going to add mind reader to your list of skills there. Um, uh, but uh, look, look, it is it is a great album. It's um, it does reward repeated listening and close listening. I think um, it's not an album actually that I think should be put on in the background because it no. does. You know, it's good to get close to it to hear all the different musical nuances and the lyrics and the stories within everything like little green man when you release that as a single i remember thinking what's this going to be about and then listening to it i thought oh wow that is so totally not what i thought um Ooh. it could be and it's um yeah it's a beautiful story that one it, yeah the, the title sounds like talking about someone that's jealous um or, or an or alien an alien. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not yeah. people can go and listen to find out what it's about i guess <laughs> yeah, yeah absolutely so yeah. um another thing that's interesting about um one of the tracks on the record um tc cassidy recorded april fools yeah uh, on, with, with bill chambers and we cut more of a kind of country ballad version hmm. uh, of that song, but I wanted to show another side of it after it was released as a single and people were really positively reacting to it. I thought, oh, well, you know, it'd be cool to kind of do do my own spin on on this, how hmm. I heard it originally, a little bit Joe Cocker, Leon Russell kind of influenced mm-hmm. um, with that one. It, it, it definitely has that almost... Um, uh, opening kind of similar to Unchain My Heart, where it's mm. it's just the vocal and the piano and then the band kicks in after that. So, mm. um, uh, yeah, it, it was great fun trying to, um, you know, I suppose present people with a, a different take on that song. And there was a couple of lyrical changes um, in that song, you know, so, so that I can sing it as opposed to, you know, to, to TC doing it mm. too because um yeah it, it's it, it's i've i have had to make it work for a male perspective as well so mm-hmm. um a, a friend of mine phil vassar had said that um it, it, he had a few few hit songs with jody messina um bye bye and i'm all right and he said he originally wrote those um you know in in his own voice in, in right. you know from from his perspective but then when he heard jody was cutting he actually adapted the songs similarly to um to suit a female artist so i i thought that was that was really kind of interesting so yeah. when he recorded those songs himself, um, he could just go back to the version that he wrote originally. So that's kind right. of cool. Yeah. Well, um, because you, know, you are both the writer and producer for TC and for yourself, you can do whatever you like. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> that's the cool. ben- benefit of being the overlord, I think. Now, yeah. um, speaking of a project in which you are also the writer and producer, we are accelerating towards the end of the year. And for me, that means dusting off the gilly season, which was your Christmas EP. <laughs> Unless you've written some more Christmas songs, Angus. Well, no, I have not. So it, the gilly season will have to do, unfortunately. <laughs> well, that's I'm 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 very happy to be listening to it again because I did listen to it a little obsessively last Christmas. If anyone has not heard the gilly season, I do recommend it. It's especially on Christmas morning. It really gets you right in the mood for the the visitors who are about to arrive. <laughs> 
I actually just come across it the other day. I haven't heard it since Christmas, and I, I was listening to to Don't Get Your Tinsel in a Tangle, and oh. and uh, yeah, I, I, it's it's a catchy song. That was a lot. It's of a fun. very catchy. It's it's yeah, for me at some points too catchy because it was an earworm for about five weeks. But yeah. <laughs> it's a good <laughs> earworm to have. Um, now somewhere that that you will not be by Christmas time, but maybe soon afterwards is Nashville. Um, so you have some plans to go for quite a while actually so what's prompted that well you know just the fact that I'm I write so much and I'm producing so much that um I kind of I'm a little bit isolated in Port Macquarie I'm a little bit away from the action it's a beautiful place to live and I've lived here most of my life um but it's time for me to kind of move further afield and you know Sydney's expensive and it's a you know I I love going to Sydney but I, I get I find it very hard to get around um when I when I do frequent Sydney um and so I thought well you know I either move to Sydney or I move to Nashville and I thought well I've got a lot of friends in Nashville more friends than in Sydney and uh, you know a, a lot of my regular cult, you know collaborators live over there and I thought well I think that's where I'm going to end up. So um, I'm, I haven't seen a lot of my good friends for four or five years. So I'm really looking forward to getting back over there. And, um, you know, I, I'm just kind of doing what I'm, what I'm doing here, but, but over there and, and be able to conduct a lot more live tracking sessions with all the players in the same room at the same time and, and do a hell of a lot of face-to-face -face writing. So um, I'm looking forward to it. Now, are all those instruments we can see over your shoulders going with you? Oh well, uh, um, I don't know. <laughs> I, I I think it it will be hard to whittle them down. That's that's for sure. So uh, we will see how many I can actually get over there. Right. And before that, are uh, you heading to Tamworth? Yes, I am. I've just got my my dates for my two shows that I'm doing at the Tamworth Services Club. Uh, with Picky Jenkins, and we've we've got a very special guest lined up to uh, to come and join us as well. So it's it's going to be a lot of fun, and I'm I'm so glad that I get to do Tamworth for another year. I'm sure your fans are very glad as well. And in the meantime, they can listen to Departure and Arrival, which is taking on literal application for you. But you'll be arriving in Tamworth <laughs> and then departing. So um, we'll reverse that. But yeah, it's a great album, Angus. Congratulations. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> Well, maybe you just wrote it into existence. <laughs> <laughs> I had that title actually long before. That that was probably one of the first songs that I, I wrote for the album and it was written over the process of a couple of years. So right. interesting. <laughs> there you go. Again, so you can still, still may have written it into existence, but no, congratulations. It was great to talk to you about it. And I commend this album to everyone. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Angus. See you.